As soon as he gets in, I realize I have probably made a horrible mistake. The dark vehicle continued to closely follow, flash their brights and motion to her to pull over. Fear and confusion set in as Aunt Kay began to question what was going on. That feeling of dread is so fiercely visceral. What the hell is going on? What is out there? Headphones recommended. Listener discretion advised. Welcome back in, everyone. I'm your host, Chad. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. So brace yourself. This is Disturbed. And here we are, the first month of a new year almost gone already. As we head into February and the temperatures remain low, I've got a great way for you to cozy up and stay warm. The new Disturbed Hoodie. Now, it's only available to our supporters through Patreon. So if you want to unlock some bonus episodes, ditch the ads, and even claim your hoodie, head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash support and join our Patreon today. Now then, let's get into it. You've probably heard countless horror stories involving hitchhikers. Reddit user SaltySirenXO has her own tale, and luckily, she made it out alive. Performing this experience is Addison Peacock. The first and only hitchhiker I will ever pick up. So last Friday, I, 25 female, had a little time to kill before picking my kids up from school, and it was a gorgeous day, so I decided to spend some time cruising some back roads in my hometown, small, rural, listening to music. I passed this guy with his thumb out trying to catch a ride, and I almost picked this guy up. He looked to be about late 30s, early 40s, carrying a fishing pole and a backpack. Pretty innocent looking, I guess. But see, I'm a lone female and have been taught with hundreds of hitchhiker gone wrong stories that you just keep driving. So I kept driving. And as I'm driving, I'm having this internal dialogue of guilt about my decision not to pick up this guy. You know, if I was hitchhiking, I'd hope someone would pick me up. And I mean, really, what's the worst that could happen? That mixed with my new self-improvement goal of doing the things that scare me as often as possible led me to the conclusion that if when I looped back around he was still walking, I would pick him up. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, he was still there. I was feeling a little nervous pulling over, getting him, but what was I going to do? Peel out while he was trying to get in my vehicle? As soon as he gets in, I realize I have probably made a horrible mistake. One, because he seemed like he was tweaking balls and smelled god-awful. Two, because this dude was looking at me like I was a feast and he was starved. I didn't realize exactly how rattled I was with my decision until he asked me for a smoke and my hands were shaking so bad I barely pulled one out of my pack without breaking it. Driving made it easier to hide my nerves, but I was internally freaking out and trying to decide how I would beat this guy's ass if he tried anything. His name is Wayne, and he lives about five minutes from where I picked him up. Meanwhile, he's telling me how he lost his license due to DUIs and how he's living in this house with an old man. He tried to get him to come with him, but he didn't want to come, etc. He's also trying to talk me into hanging out at said house with him and come over and drink with him the next day. When I finally get him to his destination, it's a little shack-like thing, surrounded by all these junk cars and shit. He gets out and is trying still to get me to come inside with him. I tell him no and leave. 
I'm feeling really relieved and a little proud that I faced a fear of mine. Fast forward to Monday, my instructor says, holy shit, apparently someone got murdered down the so-and-such road. Do you know anyone down that way? I say, wow, you know, that's really ironic. I took a hitchhiker down that road Friday. His name was Wayne, I think. Probably wasn't 15 minutes later when I see old Wayne's picture on Facebook saying the TBI had picked him up for stabbing someone to death at the very house I dropped him off at Friday. Graphic information of how he stabbed him in the lungs and the victim bled out in that little shack. And the old man he was living with doesn't even exist. I swear, I'll never pick up another hitchhiker in my life. The first time I ever got the balls to pick up a hitchhiker, he turned out to be a murderer, whom I conveniently deposited at the scene of the crime. A huge thank you to all of our newest Patreon members. Your support directly contributes to a higher quality show. Crystal Fallon, Katrina Passantrilli, Jordan, Belle Dombrowski, James Harrington, Henry Carter, and Mike Hecker. Thanks so much for supporting the show, and you can too. Become part of the podcast, unlock bonus episodes, ad free listening, and even claim your disturbed hoodie. Just head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash support to get your exclusive access today. Next up, our title story, and we hear from the good folks over at the 3AM podcast. Make sure you go subscribe and find them on social at the 3AM pod. Now this story speaks for itself. There's no intro required when it comes to surviving a serial killer. Performing this experience is Tom Aglio. My friends and I have a podcast where we tell scary stories. This is one that is infamous in my family and that I grew up hearing and telling. Back in the 80s, my Aunt Kay was in her early 20s. This was before she married my uncle, and she would drive long distances back and forth between her parents and my uncles to visit. It was a transitional period for them. He had just graduated and she hadn't moved out yet to be with him. It was a long drive across several states through the desert, which took her hours. This desolate highway would have stretches of road that lasted hundreds of miles, where you quite often wouldn't see another driver, let alone a gas station. So Aunt Kay set out and began one of these journeys. A couple hours into the drive, Aunt Kay noticed a dark vehicle slowly catching up to her. She barely noticed as she continued to sing along to Les Miserables until the vehicle got aggressively close. She turned off the music and looked into her rearview mirror, seeing the vehicle flash its brights and a hand pointing at her car and motioning to pull over. Alarmed, she quickly slowed and began to look for a good place to pull off the road to see what must be wrong with her car. The second she began to pull off the road, She said she felt and heard as clear as day, don't pull over. Then again, stronger, don't pull over. Call it God, intuition, or just a gut feeling, but a jolt of adrenaline and fear shot through Aunt Kay's body as she hit the gas and peeled back out onto the highway. Heart pumping, Aunt Kay silently asked herself, what the hell was that? As she saw the vehicle peel out behind her, the dark vehicle continued to closely follow, flashed their brights and motioned to her to pull over. Fear and confusion set in as Aunt Kay began to question what was going on. Why was the driver motioning for her to pull over? Was there something wrong with her car and what the hell was that warning she felt? It would have been a severe situation if her car broke down out there, especially before cell phones, but she pressed on. Just as her resolve wavered, she started questioning if she truly did feel what she felt. She started slowing back down when the dark vehicle picked up speed. It entered into the oncoming traffic lane and came level to my aunt's car. The driver smiled, pointed, motioned, and mouthed the words, pull over to my aunt. She said the second she looked into his eyes, she felt pure evil. 
She felt a horribly sick feeling in the pit of her stomach and again, heard the words in her head, don't pull over. She described him as looking scary, greasy, and noticed he was missing a couple teeth in his smile that she'll never forget. That sent chills through her. This quickly dispelled any thought she had of pulling over, and she put the pedal to the metal to try to lose him. He chased after her. She slowed down, he slowed down. She sped up, he sped up. It got to the point that he began to try to push her car off the road. Aunt Kay was to the point of tears as this creep continued to terrorize her alone out in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Aunt Kay sees a couple of semis off in the distance. She felt if only she could get closer or even get in between those trucks, she would be safe, so she took off. He continued to flash his lights, honk his horn, and try to hit her car until she got close enough to the trucks. As she got in between them, she saw the dark vehicle slow way down and eventually disappear from view. She stayed with the trucks for a couple hours until she felt safe enough to pull over at a gas station and cry. Fast forward several years, my aunt and uncle are married. He's working at a law firm as a high-profile criminal prosecutor in Las Vegas. She's now a full-time mom of several young children. Since I've known my aunt, she's been obsessed with true crime. Dateline, 2020, and Unsolved Mysteries were always playing at their house. This day was no different. She was folding laundry in the kitchen while listening to the TV in the other room. The interviewer was talking about a man who was being interviewed on death row. As she paired another match of socks, she heard the man describe one of his tactics for procuring victims. According to him, he would wait along the side of the highway. A car would go by with a family and he'd wait. Another car with a male driver would go by and he'd wait. But every so often, a car would go by with a pretty woman driving alone. So I'd pull out behind and follow him. I'd flash my brights, honk, and motion for him to pull over. Aunt Kay, paralyzed, continued to listen. When they would eventually pull over, I'd tell him to pop the hood, and I'd be able to tell him what was wrong with their car. They would, and I'd yank a couple wires. When the car wouldn't start, I'd tell him, no problems, my buddy has a shop in the next town. I can give you a ride, and he'll give you a fair deal. My aunt slowly moved to the living room. They'd get in, and I'd rape and kill them. Bury them anywhere in the desert. When asked how many times he did this, he responded, they'll never find all the bodies I can't even count. And how many got away? Two or three. My aunt stood alone staring into the same toothless grin she saw on that highway that day. It was Henry Lee Lucas. Allow me to set the scene for our next story. You're sitting at home at night when suddenly the TV cuts out and goes snowy. Your cat senses danger and you hear a side door open. This was the scenario facing Reddit user Emil6. And join me in welcoming our newest narrator to the show, Kennedy Ray. This happened 15 years ago when I had just come home from college on winter break. Home this time was not the house I grew up in. My parents had just moved closer to our small city, so it just didn't feel the same to be in a different space. Maybe that's what triggered my worry. In my family, I'm always the one thinking of the worst case scenarios, generally distrustful and mostly seeming like the annoying worry wart. Call it what you will, but it's also the gift of fear, am I right? One cold night, my parents had gone to bed upstairs and the dog had followed suit. I thought I'd watch TV in the living room for a bit before going to sleep and settled in on the couch. The living room was in the front of the house, and with the recent move, the shutters on the windows weren't there at the time. Only see-through curtains that weren't really drawn. I noted this, but was used to our rural setting, where the only ones who could see in were the neighbors we knew so well. I'm watching TV for about half an hour when the screen cuts out. It just goes snowy. This was back in the days when you watched whatever your local cable channels brought you. I looked up from whatever I was doing, texting, maybe with a flip phone, at first thinking, well, that sucks, but something felt off. 
I tried the remote, but no other channels worked, and so I was sitting there thinking what I should do instead when my cat jumps up onto the windowsill and starts wailing. What the fuck? This may seem innocuous, but anyone who knew my cat knew this was not par for the course. He was pacing and wailing at the window. A feeling of dread washed through me, and I was frozen. That feeling of dread is so fiercely visceral. What the hell is going on? What is out there? I tried to settle myself down in this unfamiliar, dark house and felt a bit better because what are the chances? But then there it was. I swear on all I have that this cold waft of air blew through and that I heard the side door. I didn't realize the door was there at the time. I heard a door on the side of the house and felt cold air. I became unfrozen. I bolted. I run upstairs to wake my parents and slumbering dog and frantically tell them someone is trying to get in the house. They, I think, were annoyed. I'm a worrier, remember? Still, they get up, and I think try to placate me by looking around the house. They go check all the rooms, including the basement, while I'm scared and exasperated. They are sleepily roaming about into dark rooms unarmed when God knows who has probably made it inside already. Well, they didn't find anything. They verbally patted me on the head and said goodnight, and I felt foolish. That is, until the next morning. I don't know what prompted my parents to call the police, but they showed up and asked me how I knew someone was out there. Well, hold up, what? I start answering. Well, the cat was meowing a lot at the window seal, and my voice trailed off, waiting for the reaction I usually get, which I got. The cop smirks. A cat, huh? <sighs> Kebra, get on with it. He goes on to say that someone cut the cable wires on the side of the house. That either the someones thought they were disarming the alarm, or they saw me sitting watching TV and wanted to mess with me. And the side door? Muddy Grounds gave us the ability to see the fresh tracks right up to it. It didn't look like it had been fooled with, but I know what I heard, whatever it was. I knew it, I said to my parents. The triumphant feeling was short-lived when I start to mull what I was so sure about had been true. True, I did know someone was out there. I also knew I would always check that side door and take some cues from the cat just to be safe. Hey everyone, Nicole Goodnight here, letting you know that this episode is made possible by Factor. Do you struggle to find the time and energy to consistently eat healthy? You're not alone, and there's a solution. Introducing Factor, the all-in-one meal delivery service that preps, cooks, and delivers fresh, never frozen, fully prepared meals directly to your door weekly. With Factor, every meal is designed by dietitians and handcrafted by world-class chefs, keeping your taste buds happy and your waistline trim. What's more, the menu changes every week, so you never lose interest in eating healthy. Right now, Factor is offering Disturbed listeners $50 off over their first two weeks. Just go to factor75.com, pick your meals, and use code PODCAST50 at checkout to claim this limited time offer. That's factor75.com, code PODCAST50. Now back to the show. We've heard several experiences involving internet predators. But one man went to extraordinary lengths in a devious plot against Reddit user Stupefy92. Performing this experience is Nicole Goodnight. I'm mostly a lurker on here, but have considered sharing my story several times. I was hesitant because absolutely no one knows about this. Not my family, nor my friends. I've held on to this for 10 years now and figured it was time to let it out. Plus, I think there are some valuable lessons that can be learned from my experience. Here we go. 
caution, it's a long story ahead. For reference, I am a 27-year-old female and this story takes place 10 years ago when I was 17. I had just started university and was excited about having a fresh new start since I'd always been a nerdy outcast in high school. I had never had a boyfriend before, I'd never even been on a date, so I was naive and optimistic about boys. My introverted and awkward personality hadn't magically changed since entering university, so it's safe to say that I didn't meet any interesting guys at school. One late night, I was in my room working on an assignment on my laptop when I received a request on MSN Messenger. The email address was a boy's name with some numbers. The name was clearly ethnic and likely someone of the same origin as me. Intrigued, I accepted. For the sake of the story, we'll call this boy Ken. We got to chatting and I asked him how he had gotten my email address. He dodged the question. I let it go, not thinking much of it. This was from a time when it was normal to accept anyone and everyone as a friend on Facebook and other social media platforms. As Ken and I continued to talk, I learned that he lived in my city and apparently wasn't much older than me. As I'd guessed, our roots were in fact the same country, let's call it Motherland. (laughs) I asked him why he didn't have a picture of himself on his display picture and this prompted him to suggest we turn on our webcams because he wanted to see me too. I declined, but he insisted. Somehow he convinced me and we both switched on our webcams. I was pleasantly surprised and somewhat relieved to see that Ken was a good-looking young guy chatting to me from the comfort of his bedroom, seemingly very normal. Our MSN chats carried on for a couple of weeks. They developed into texts and we even had a few phone calls after I had agreed to give him my phone number. I started to develop a crush on Ken. He asked me to go out with him a couple of times, but I was always pretty busy with school and our schedules weren't lining up. Finally, we found one afternoon when we were both free and decided to schedule a lunch date. Ken had a car and had offered to pick me up from my university after I was done for the day. I was a little too dressed up for my C-plus programming class, but just right for the lunch date we had planned at a local vegetarian restaurant. Stupidly, I didn't tell any of my friends where I was going or with whom because I was embarrassed about going on my very first date at almost age 18, with someone who had randomly added me on MSN. I waited outside my building when a black car with heavily tinted windows pulled up beside me. The passenger side window rolled down and, sure enough, there was Ken, sitting in the driver's seat. I was happy to see that he was as cute in person as he was on webcam, however, what I wasn't expecting was the intense smell of weed floating out of the car. Not relevant, but part of the first impression. Admittedly, I was a bit taken aback and was concerned that he might be driving high. He unlocked the doors and motioned for me to get in, so I did, without dispute. As I sat down in the passenger seat and he immediately put his hand on my thigh, I nervously shifted my leg away. So, I started. Do you know where the restaurant is? I can guide you if you want. He smirked at me, but didn't say anything and just started driving. Okay, kind of weird. I thought maybe he was just nervous or awkward, both of which I could sympathize with, so I let it be. I was about to try my hand at a little small talk, which I'm no good at, when I noticed him heading towards the highway ramp. I started to worry because the restaurant was not far from my campus and there was no reason for us to be getting on the highway. You don't need to take the highway, the restaurant is really close by, I can guide you. I tried to keep my voice steady, but I could hear my own nervousness. Ken finally spoke for the first time since I'd gotten in the car. I thought maybe we could just go to my place instead. We can play Need for Speed and I can make lunch for you. I was 17, on my way to the house of a guy I'd just met for the first time and I hadn't told anyone where I was going. My mind was racing. I knew that this would be an utterly stupid thing to do. Despite the clear red flags waving in my face, I decided that I didn't want to ruin our first date by rejecting his offer to make me lunch and play NFS together, which I told him I liked playing. Don't judge me. (laughs) So, like an idiot, I reluctantly agreed to avoid being rude. We made it to his house. It was apparently his family's home and was situated in sort of a shady neighborhood. We stepped inside and of course no one was home except us. It was sparsely furnished and looked unkempt, which struck me as pretty odd for a family home. He informed me that his Xbox was in his bedroom. I hesitated in the doorway, but he sat at the foot of his bed in front of the TV and patted the empty space beside him for me to have a seat. 
There was literally nowhere else to sit in his room, so I cautiously sat down, keeping as much distance as I could between us. I started to relax as we played NFS and he made us PB&Js to munch on. I was about to laugh at myself for being overly paranoid when Ken did something bizarre. He got up onto the bed and sat down directly behind me, his legs on either side of me, and extremely awkward position and tried to guide my hands on the controller. I started to ask him what he was doing and, as if this wasn't uncomfortable enough, his hands moved from the controller and slid up under my shirt. That's when I really started to panic. I thought he was going to try to grope my chest, but instead he started squeezing and massaging my belly. I was more than a little chubby back then, freshman 15 and then some, so you can imagine what that might have been like. I dropped the controller in pure shock and quickly stood up, fixing my shirt. I was at a loss for words, and he did nothing but smirk at me and tell me he liked it. I felt completely disgusted and violated. I'd had enough. I lied and told him that I had a group project to work on and needed to go. He asked where I lived so he could drop me home. Thankfully, I had the common sense to not tell him, and I asked him to drop me back to school instead, where I would be supposedly meeting my classmates. He obliged. After our very uncomfortable first date, I decided I didn't want to talk to Ken anymore. I didn't block him on MSN or on my phone, our only two methods of communication, but I rarely responded to his messages and I ignored all of his calls. Once he messaged me on MSN around 11pm, asking me to come over and telling me that he would send a cab to bring me over to his place. Thoroughly annoyed, I responded, What do you take me for? Why do you even think I would want to do that? He replied saying, No sex, I promise. Just bizarre. I was disgusted and didn't even respond. He continued to try to get in touch with me for months and then suddenly vanished. I figured he'd finally gotten the point. Now, I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. I last heard from Ken in late February. He had stopped trying to contact me shortly after Valentine's Day. In April... Two nuclear family members and I went on holiday to visit another relative, who we'll call Anne, who was living in the Caribbean at the time. Anne, whom I love dearly, was and still is a bit of an eccentric. She considers herself very spiritual and an active member of a large, well-known spiritual organization. She's deeply connected with Motherland, more than the rest of us are, and goes back for frequent visits. While we stayed with her in the Caribbean, she told us about her most recent spiritual trip to Motherland where she met a wealthy and well-connected local woman through the organization who quickly became a very close friend. Let's call her Connie, the con artist. During our visit, Anne introduced us to Connie virtually over Skype because Connie lives in Motherland. We chatted with her a couple of times throughout our vacation via Skype and got to know her a little bit. Little did we know back then that Connie, who Anne had spontaneously met halfway across the world in Motherland, would soon wreak utter havoc on our lives. Now that's a story that I'm just not, and may never be, ready to tell because of how many lives were affected and the severity of the damage that had been inflicted. What you need to know is that Connie was an outright criminal and con artist who had been targeting our family from long before Anne had actually met her. Their meeting was no coincidence. Not only did she manage to steal over $100,000 from our family, but she took any peace of mind or sense of security we ever had. When we finally caught on and confronted her, she insisted that we were mistaken, but disappeared into thin air once we forced her out of our lives. You're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with my story about Ken. Well, get this. The situation with Connie lasted many months. The whole thing is kind of a blur to me now, but... We first spoke to her online in April, and I remember the whole ordeal lasting well into the fall. While she normally resided in Motherland, Anne had invited her to visit and stay with us, where we, my whole family and I, presently live. That's when things really took a turn for the worse. Some of the things I clearly remember and are important to the story were that, one, the whole time she was staying with us, she was trying to convince me to transfer schools to a very obscure school and program in the U.S., I don't even live in the U.S., and was actually getting very pushy about it. And two, she had asked me if I was a virgin and told me to save myself for my husband. Disturbing, I know. 
During this time, I was so emotionally drained and stressed that I didn't really think of anything but the situation at hand. In fact, I had stopped socializing almost entirely and even started habitually skipping classes. I had lost contact with my high school friends and my university friends were too new to really care, so my strange behavior and new destructive habits went unnoticed. Fast forward to one day, after Connie's final disappearance in the fall, I was at home with my dad when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID and it was a number I didn't have saved, so it was showing the contact information as whatever name the phone was registered under. My heart dropped into my stomach. My phone displayed a name. The first name was a man's name and the last name was the same last name as Connie's. I started to panic and ran into my bedroom to answer the call. I had no idea what to expect. When I picked up the phone, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was Ken. I honestly thought I was going to puke when I came to the sudden realization that he had been a part of this whole sick plot. Of course, I don't have hard evidence to prove that he was connected to Connie, but let me explain. The timing of his appearance and reappearance into my life. The last name, a fairly unique surname originating from the part of Motherland where Connie is from, and I had never known Ken's last name until then. And the fact that he contacted me out of the blue and I had no idea why or how were all just too bizarre to be mere coincidence. Of course, I freaked out at Ken when he called and I told him that if he ever called me again, I would call the police. His response was just a weird, dry half laugh and then he said, Well, okay then, in the most creepy voice you can think of and hung up. I knew in my gut that this was their last attempt to get back in touch and somehow slither their way back into mine, my family's lives. Thankfully, I never heard from Ken again after that day. A while after this all ended, I was having a conversation with a family member who was also closely involved in all this, about the whole ordeal, and she told me she'd sensed something extremely wrong when Connie was pushing to have me sent off to the U.S. to that obscure school. She had an unshakable feeling that Connie was involved in some sort of human trafficking scene and that if I left, she would never see me again. The horrifying pieces came together for me at that time. I I was just too damn naive to have seen it before. The memories flooded back to me when I heard that, how... Ken had told me no sex, I promise, when he invited me over and how Connie was telling me to remain a virgin. As I said, I'd never told a soul about Ken, nor about the weird V-card conversation with Connie. I strongly and firmly believed that Ken had been some sort of player in Connie's game and was just there to keep me away from guys and prevent me from having a boyfriend. For those who may be wondering, we never called the police on Connie or Ken because nothing illegal happened at face value. It's very hard to explain. I'll also mention that I tried to find Ken online many times after this all ended. I don't know why I felt like I wanted to expose him or or call him out, and was not even able to find a sliver of information on him, not by the name Ken, nor by the name on the caller ID. It was as if he didn't even exist. Also, I'm awful at directions and don't remember his address or where his house was exactly. I'm sorry if this story is convoluted or confusing. I'm trying to get my point across without giving out names or too many details, which makes it a little challenging. I hope this can serve as a warning to young people to never trust anyone, to do your thorough checks on people, especially those you meet online, and to be very aware and weary of people's intentions. Also, from this incident onward, I can't stomach a lot of these spiritual organizations. I never liked the idea of them to begin with, but... Now I've truly experienced how they can attract both vulnerable people and also unsavory characters who are looking for someone vulnerable to prey on. No judgment for those who are into that sort of thing, it's just definitely not for me. I would like to hear what you guys think about this. Do you think my suspicions are plausible? What do you make of this? Stay safe, everyone. And to Ken and Connie, if I ever see either of you again, I will kick you in the face rotten hell. Before we go, don't forget you can support the show to become part of the podcast and get access to bonus episodes, ad-free listening, and much more. Visit disturbedpodcast.com slash support to get your access today. Disturbed is a Disturbed Media original podcast. Musical score by White Bat Audio, Co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. 
thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.